and adult learning trips through an online marketplace where people can search for museum educational programs and other venues by age appropriateness, subject matter, and other features, and soon to be book online as well. So work with a lot of museums in that capacity. And I also used to head up marketing for the New England Quilt Museum and Mall. So shoestring marketing of a variety of different reasons I know is a topic near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. And there are so many different opportunities that you can find to market your museum on a shoestring. So with that, um, if we'd like to give everybody a second or two to fill out the survey, I just also want to remind everybody that this, record, this um, webinar is being recorded. So if you need to go get into a meeting or you want to share this with a colleague, please do um, share it with a colleague. Also, Heather um, is posting a wonderful set of resources that I've discovered over the years um, for marketing on a shoestring as well as we at EdTrips have a free guide with a lot of the material in this webinar but also a lot of things that I just could not get around to covering. So with that, let's go into our presentation. All right, so let me about, to end voting, sorry. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you missed your chance to vote. Um, but it looks like a lot of people did reply. And it looks like a lot of people are doing a bunch of different digital marketing. They're doing email, social media. I see a lot of folks are also doing print and direct mail. And lots of folks, surprisingly large number of people, are doing outdoors, so posters, billboards, and bus signs. So that's great. It looks like there is a really good variety of different kinds of marketing. And we're going to talk about how you can optimize each and every channel and reach your target audience affordably. So with that, more visitors, obviously. That's why you're in a museum. You want people to come in the door, but you do not want to go over the proverbial fiscal cliff. So you need a plan for cost-effective and effective marketing. So it's easy enough to do anything on the cheap, but oftentimes you get what you pay for. So what you really need to think about is how do we market ourselves in a way that's cost-effective but also works. So step one, you need a strategy. And the number one thing to do when you're developing a strategy is to look at what you want to accomplish at the end of the day. So everyone wants more visitors, but let's break it down a little bit more. So do you want more visitors in general? Do you want more tour groups, whether they're people taking field trips or groups of adult hobbyists coming into your museum? And in addition to more visitors, do you want more donors? Do you want more people to come in and volunteer, take part in your docent program? What are your goals? I suppose most of you, if we, if we could see everybody do a show of hands, would say all of the above. We want more people coming in the door. We want more money. We want more docents. Um, we want more volunteers. But you have to set priorities. So maybe you would want to set a couple of goals, such as um, one thing that I did in the past is let's set a goal of I'd like to triple the number of bus tours that are coming in. And that's an achievable goal because it's got a number attached to it. So we want to triple the number. And we want to set a deadline, such as within 18 months. And it's very concrete. We want more bus tours. We want more third grade science students coming in on field trips. We want more walk-in traffic of people who see a poster and decide to come in as individuals or a small group of friends. Set a group of realistic goals and prioritize them. So if a lot of your revenue comes from tour buses, obviously that's going to be a bigger priority than walk-in traffic. If a lot of your volunteers originally come in as individual visitors, then you might want to look at how are we going to convert individual visitors into volunteers. Set the priorities. It's fine to decide that some are much more important than others based on whether they help you achieve your organizational goals. Because with that, you can then decide to set up a plan and it's going to work. You have to look at what you already have as resources. Because now that you've got goals, you've probably got more resources than you think to help you meet those goals. We're really in a very good era now for marketing because much of current marketing uses quote unquote free channels, and I'll get back to why I say quote unquote free channels in a minute, that depend on your current visitors and supporters, like social media. 
email marketing. These are channels that don't cost a lot of financial investment. And I do say quote unquote free though, as I said before, because they do involve time, they involve innovation, and they involve creativity. So nothing in life is 100% free, but these don't cost you a lot of money. They cost you things that you as a museum professional, we all have plenty of passion, integrity, energy, and a real devotion to whatever, whatever our cause is as a museum. So that's what you can invest rather than thin finances. There's also a lot of traditional channels that are affordable and that museums are in a very good, unique, I would say, position to leverage, such as PR. And I'll get around to that in a little bit. So when you look around at what you want, Next, you want to do an inventory of what you have that will help you achieve that. So do you have a really strong mailing list? Do a majority of your museum visitors sign your book and get on your mailing list and give you their email address? Maybe you've got 50,000 people on your mailing list if you're a small museum, or millions of people on your mailing list if you're a large one, people who maybe have been there once. I can't tell you how many museums have one-time visitors who maybe came there, you know, maybe they were a high school student on a field trip or they were somebody on a group tour that, you know, slept through 15 different venues in one day and they signed up for the email list and a year or two later they're coming back and they're bringing their friends because they had such a good time. So you have a lot of visitor loyalty locked into some of those resources like your email list, your social media followers, and your Facebook friends. And we're going to talk about how we're going to leverage those for some free marketing. So now decide what you're going to go after. And this goes back to those concrete numbers that we said. And now we're going to get them even more concrete. So we set, we want to triple it, we want to increase it by 50%. This is the time frame we want to do that by. Now that you know what you have has for resources, now that you know what those concrete goals are, tie them to each other. So we are going to try to use social media, email marketing, and digital advertising to increase the number of tour groups that are coming in. We're going to use social media to increase the number of volunteers that we have. Be very concrete. The plan can always change. I'm a big believer in agile marketing, which is the theory that marketing moves so fast nowadays and it's so fluid that you would be able to change your marketing and in fact have to change your marketing every quarter in order to respond to what works and what hasn't worked. And this also really plays into the idea of affordable marketing because you're constantly testing to see what's actually getting you those goals reached. So if I take out this ad, do I three months down the line have more inquiries for bus tours? If I put this poster up in every bus stop, do we have more walk-in traffic? In three months' time, you're likely to know the answer. So instead of committing to spending a year's worth of marketing budget in January or whenever your fiscal year begins, you'll only spend a quarter You'll spend it for one fiscal quarter and you'll see what works. And if something was wildly successful, you can allocate budget from something that was maybe less successful into those really wildly successful initiatives. And you'll make your dollar go that much further. So what you want to do in order to start maximizing that budget is decide what to go after and allocate resources to goals. Then you're going to be able to measure. So let's get down to some solid tactics and strategies that will help you create a really good cost-effective marketing campaign. Targeting is the holy grail of modern marketing. Targeting is actually really simple. It sounds like it's really complicated. It sounds like, oh my god, now I have to do targeting. What is that? But basically, it is built on the principle that people respond best to messages that strongly touch their interests. They need to know why should they go to your museum. Um, at Ed Trips, because we basically connect K through 12 teachers and college professors with museums, I talk to a lot of teachers about what they're looking for in a field trip venue. And these are very specific needs. And they're different from, say, a senior group or if you're a quilt museum, just a group of quilters or a railroad museum's group of railroad enthusiasts. They want programs, for instance, that are accessible for children who have special needs. 
They want a place where there's allergy-free, peanut-free food that they can get. They want to make sure that your staff has been quarried. Anyone who comes in contact with the children has had a background check. And they want to make sure that the educational programs, whether they're about history or starfish or botany, are adhering to some very strict national guidelines on education called the Common Core. So when you're targeting, for instance, if you were targeting teachers to bring their kids in on class trips, you would want to know what does a teacher want from my venue. And your marketing would center around telling her or him that your venue provides that. Same if you're talking to families or adults. If I'm going out with a group of friends um, early in the evening and we want to catch a museum and then we want to catch dinner, um, our needs are going to be very different. You want to make sure that you emphasize that you're a fun place to go, that you're a great place to go with friends, and that you're conveniently located to some trendy restaurants, for instance. So you're probably appealing to five or six different core demographics as a museum, especially if you're a specialized museum. And you really want to understand who your five best types of attendees are. Let's say it's K through 12 teachers, seniors, groups of friends, and maybe adult bus tours as well as summer tours. They're all going to have different interests, and you're going to want to develop marketing specifically for every single one of them. So for instance, these are the specific needs as we discussed for a teacher. You're going to want to sit down and write down what those needs are. You really want to identify them. Ideally, you're going to talk to somebody who's in that demographic or a group of them or do a survey and ask what they need or do research online and find out what they need. You're going to identify those needs and then what you're going to do is address them in every piece of marketing you put out. It will make your marketing that much more effective. You know, you probably have great, like a generic brochure, we all do that, and it tries to be all things to all people. And obviously, since it's a piece of print material, you have to be very, very broad. You can only print a brochure maybe once a year. But when you get into other forms of marketing, it's very important that it be tailored to the audience that you're trying to reach. So for instance, if you're taking out a print ad in the local parents' paper, you're not going to want to show uh, obviously, and none of us would, a group of friends out enjoying a cocktail and then swinging by your museum because that's not really going to, that's going to turn off the parents of toddlers. You're going to show toddlers um, having fun in your museum unless that's your worst nightmare. Um, if you're a teacup museum, that's probably not going to be your ad. Um, but you're going to want to address the needs. So if you want to present yourself as a family-friendly museum, you want to show images of families, you want to emphasize this is a museum you can bring your kids, your you know, group of get together and bring their kids, maybe you're doing homeschooling, that this is a kid-friendly, family-friendly place. You want to state that explicitly. Literally, you might want to say in your ad, we are a family-friendly venue, and this is why. And you can talk about your programs you offer. You know, we offer a great scavenger hunt where kids can identify shapes and colors in the paintings. Or we have great historical interpreters who work, you know, work with school groups. So you want to really address those needs very explicitly in every piece of marketing. So people, when they see your brochure, they see your ad, they realize, oh, you know, this, is, this really does appeal to me. These people get it. They know what I'm looking for. So you really want to outline what you offer, how it meets their needs, and why it's for them. Them. Anticipate the questions they're going to have and write brochures and advertising that meets those needs, and you're going to find that your return on investment is going to be that much greater. Christina, we do have a question. Um, what do you mean by best types of attendees, and how do you determine who they are? That is a great question. So I would say best types of attendees are the ones that you feel are desirable for a specific reason. Um, it could be tied to your mission. So if your mission is to serve the community, then obviously your best types of attendees, one of them might be local school groups because part of your mission is to address the needs of the local community. It could be revenue-based. Um, a lot of museums loved, um, we loved bus groups because they you know, brought in a lot of revenue. And then that was enough for us. Other times it might be that you have some favorite types of attendees because they're more likely to turn into volunteers. If you're a museum devoted to a specific hobby or people who pursue that hobby might become your most devoted donor.
years. So honestly, the criteria are up to you, but you're definitely going to know, you know, who are the people who resonate with our mission or that the museum really she has, you know, has a warm place in their heart for. So getting back to um, getting back to targeting. So now again to use the example of teachers, you've got great materials that are written to appeal to that teacher who wants to bring her third graders in. Um, you talk about how you have these educational programs that are hands-on and scavenger hunts. You're more images of kids having a great time. And you've done a lot to you know, address the needs of that target demographic. The next thing you want to do is you want to find those people and get that message straight to them. I think the biggest way that people waste their money um, when they do marketing is that they just blast information out to the entire universe. How many, how many times have people simply bought a mailing list of everybody within the zip code? And a lot of times that does work because your audience might be everybody within a zip code, but there's also ways to meet those specific groups of people you want to meet. There are mailing lists that are just for teachers that will allow you to insert an ad into a newsletter that's for say third grade teachers. There's plenty of vendors out there like that. There are organizations you can partnership partner with, like teachers organizations, where you could sponsor one of their events and have a table and meet people face to face who go to a lot of field trips. Um, you know, of course there's that trips, but that's that's another another story. Um, there are online publications to advertise in that cater to your demographic. I mean, if you're a quilt museum, you, you have to advertise in quilting publications, for instance. And there's Facebook advertising that's very, very targetable. I, it, Facebook knows a lot about its users, for better or worse. You can absolutely target an ad on Facebook only to people who share a specific interest. So, for instance, you can target people who have checked off that they are a K-12 teacher if your interest is reaching teachers. If your interest is railroad enthusiasts, you can find people who have liked pages related to railroading. So you can find just about any audience on Facebook and spend your advertising dollars on only getting in front of them. The uh, nice thing about targeting as well is that it's very easy to get people to share your message because they'll be engaged with it because it meets their needs and people tend to have friends who also have the same interests. So they're very likely to share that message. It's also very easy to measure the response when you're doing Facebook advertising. When you, when you purchase an ad in a newsletter targeted towards your demographic, all of these come with really good metrics built in so you'll know right away if your investment is working. Christina, before you go on, there is another question. Um, it, may, it may or may not um, fall under your purview. How can a small museum with a skeleton crew of volunteers increase membership and donations? That's, that's a big challenge for a lot of organizations. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of options. One of them, and I'm glad it did come up right now, is Google Grants. Um, Google offers $10,000 a month in free advertising. And that's in the resource sheet that's going to be shared with everybody, a link to apply for this grant. $10,000 in free advertising to nonprofits um, that can make a compelling case that their mission needs to be advertised online. So that anytime somebody types in keywords when they're searching on, on Google related to your mission, they're going to see an ad for your museum. And that would be completely free. And they offer you training. It doesn't take an awful lot of your time. So there are events that will kind of provide you with almost set it and forget it, although you should check in every month and make sure the ads are working well and spend about an hour or two maintaining them monthly. But there are ways to target that are grant funded. And social media, I think, would also be a really good way, as well as PR, and that does tie back to um, my current slide. So this is a, a case study um, on public relations. And when I say public relations, I think we all have a stereotype of, of public relations being about calling you know, calling magazines and asking them to write a real news story and calling TV stations and the newspaper and write a real news story about the fact that your museum exists. But, you know, and the reality is, is that in this, in this world of political crises and wars and 
all kinds of change going on. The news is unlikely to care tremendously about a museum having a program teaching kids how to design really interesting book covers. It's not really going to be covered as a news item in most cases. Um, I, I often used to joke that unless somebody drives into a museum with a car and then it becomes a nightly news story, museums do not get a lot of press. However, PR is not necessarily about convincing a reporter that you have an exciting newsworthy thing happening at your museum and you absolutely do not need to drive a car into your museum. Just just forget about that. Um, it is one of the most credible channels after word of mouth from your existing attendees. And if you think creatively, you can actually get a lot of press without generating a lot of news. It's called placed content. And what it is is you leverage the expertise that you have as a museum to create really good content for niche publications as well as mainstream publications that need to hear about you and who have a really, really big need um, for content related to a specific topic that you can generate as an unbiased expert. Here's a creative thing that we did at the New England Quilt Museum where I was the head of marketing is we had wonderful intellectual property in the collection, obviously, of vintage quilts stemming back to colonial times that we had in our collections. Quilting is a 28 um, million strong community in America, and it is a $16 billion a year industry. So as you can imagine, there's actually such a thing as the quilt press, and it's very active. So getting a, getting a knowledge of what the quilt press wants, um, what they want is patterns for quilts and interesting stories about quilts and their makers. So we were able to generate a very large amount of press by writing feature articles about some beautiful works in our collection. Um, one of them that's remained very near and dear to my heart was the Emily Monroe quilt, a quilt made by a woman um, during the Civil War who had all four of her brothers fighting in different, different theaters. And it was a beautiful quilt um, depicting their home life before the war had broken out. And that story was a six-page spread in Piecework, which is a very popular magazine of historical needlework and traditional folk art. So that got us a lot of press without anything necessarily happening that would make the front page of the New York Times. We also started working on reproductions of some of the quilts that were in the collection. Now, obviously, in the 19th century, women had tons and tons of time. And these quilts were very elaborate that we had. So I designed simplified versions of 19th century quilts, worked in collaboration um, with corporate sponsors who were textile companies who wanted to sell their textiles, so it cost us nothing. They gave us the textiles because they got free press out of it. And we created these beautiful kits and these beautiful patterns that replicated 19th century quilts affordably, and that got us a lot of press in the quilt press. They would publish three, four page spreads of these different patterns. So regardless of what the topic is, you can find publications that are hungry for content related to your collections or your programs. You would be happily amazed at how many teachers would like to hear from your museum educators about great ways to get kids excited about science. There is a humongous amount of material out there, but very little of it comes from museum educators. And teachers would, for instance, want to read that. Again, going back to the idea of a railroad museum, there's railroad publications that would welcome an article by one of your curators on narrow gauge railroads, for instance. So there's thousands of things you can do to get free press. But there are rules to this. Number one, number two, and number three is familiarize yourself with the publication. I used to work as an editor, and nothing was more frustrating or got an article projected faster than somebody sending something in with a note that says, I know you don't actually publish articles about alligators because you're a sewing magazine, but here's an article about alligators. Um, you're not going to do that, 
But you are possibly, if you don't study the magazine, going to try to pitch an article to them that they've already done something very similar. So read at least six back issues, even if you can just skim through them. Get familiar with what the editors need. Do they need great quality photos? Do they need compelling human interest stories? Do they need great lists of resources? Find out what that magazine runs. And then get your strongest writer, whether they're the curator, whether they're the woman who does your grant writing, whether they're your marketing person who writes your newsletter, get a very well professionally written, polished article written. And it should inform rather than promote. So instead of just saying, hey, come to the museum, it's great, it should again talk about a wonderful piece in your collection or give people a handy pattern that they can use. And you will be surprised at the traction you get. Please bear in mind that all of these kinds of articles um, should be not paid. So if you're asked to pay to include an article, that would be what's called an advertorial, and you don't need to go that route. There are plenty of publications that will run a quality story for free, but please familiarize yourself with publication. Another good tip is always pitch first. So call up the editor or send him or her a politely written email saying, I'm thinking of writing an article about this. We, I am the curator of this wonderful house museum. We have these really interesting Civil War artifacts that tell a great story about this family that had you know, all of this history to, uh, related to the Civil War, perhaps several generations of the same family fought on both sides. Is this an interesting story to you? That way you'll waste less time and you'll get more coverage. You can also write about the same topic for multiple magazines as long as you write original articles for each one. And this is a great way to get free press. Christina, we have a couple questions. OK. Um, how do you necessarily know that any particular marketing piece has worked if you have multiple pieces out at once? Even if you ask visitors, they don't necessarily remember what they saw, um, your bus stop poster, and that's what made them come. Well, that's a really good question. And it comes up exactly when I have the slide that addresses that. <laughs> so visitors, people generally, if you ask how did you find out about us, will never remember. Um, but a lot of different digital media channels now offer ways to measure it. Social media is a particularly good way. Um, there are tools, and they're in that resource guide. Um, two of them that are mentioned are Hootsuite and TweetDeck. They will allow you to measure how many people have clicked on a link. So for instance, if you post something to Twitter, Pinterest, and Facebook, you'll be able to see how many people clicked on the link you posted to Twitter versus the one on Pinterest versus the one on Facebook. And you'll immediately be able to see, OK, everybody who's interested in what we have is on Pinterest or Facebook. Nobody pays attention on Twitter. We can tweet as little as possible and spend all our time on Pinterest. And who wouldn't want to hear that, right? Um, so you can measure it. And social media is effective. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of these newsletters will also give you um, information on who clicked through, as well as you can use a free tool from Google called Google Analytics, um, for which there are tutorials listed in the resource guide. And that will tell you how your visitors found your website online, whether it was a link in a magazine's online version or whether it was through social media. So you'll be able to tell what's driving people. Um, other reasons. Sorry, excuse me, this is BJ. There's another question. How do you concentrate your efforts to market a specific item in your collection? And in this case, she has been given an, an object that's related to a cappella music and says that there's so many a cappella groups that mm -hmm. um, she, she needs to think about how she can narrow down that, that field to market to them. I, I, I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things I would do is I would go on social media. And if you have a very limited budget, pull together an ad on Facebook, and you will be able to find a cappella pages that have hundreds of thousands of fans. And the ad would then be pushed out into the news streams of everybody who has liked a cappella on Facebook, whether it is the topic or whether it's a specific a cappella group's Facebook page. So you wouldn't have to find a mailing list of you know every a cappella group on the face of the earth, um, you could go out on Facebook and you could simply find them all aggregated in one place, create one ad, um, and Facebook would show it only to a cappella fans, for instance. Um, the other thing that I would do is share interesting content on Facebook ap about this item. So rather than just, and this, this applies to everybody, um, 
rather than just share updates on your museum's page of, oh, we'll be closing due to snow, or um, we have a new exhibit coming up, share interesting information like trivia questions about a cappella, um, surveys, polls, candid photos related to it, and you'd be surprised at how many acapella enthusiasts or whatever, you know, what have you, whatever your museum is about will see that on Facebook and share it out with their friends. In fact, don't even, don't be afraid to ask for people to share something. Ask for people to retweet it. Ask your volunteers to repost things to Facebook. I mean, obviously don't, don't pressure people if they only use Facebook. For, for personal things and they never put anything to do with their work on it, that's fine. Um, but if people are willing to, ask them to share it and you'd be surprised how many people will come in through a friends of friends connection. And that ends up with what you should be doing in social media, which is share very specific things like this acapella item. Um, share very, very specific things. Social media is the perfect place for things to go viral as they say, and share the cuter, the more engaging, the better, and you would be really, really surprised. On the Etrips Facebook page a couple of days ago, I shared a library that was going on its own field trip. It was this absolutely charming picture. Um, you can go see it as an example of a pickup truck that had been modified to be a mobile library. And I just posted the photo and said, well, see, even libraries like to take field trips. And it got tons of people liking it. Every museum's got something like that. You know, great photos, great stories, great engaging questions. People will want to engage with something like that. And the acapella community and the knitting community and the reading um, community are all just so ready to engage with your content that you will be pleasantly surprised. And again, Facebook advertising costs money, but organic posts as they're called, just stuff you don't pay to advertise is free, and you'd be surprised at how much people will share it on their own. Uh, moving on to email marketing, which I think is also a really great way to market yourself on a shoestring, because for every $40 in the corporate world that gets spent on email, um, that is for every dollar that gets spent on email in the corporate world, $40 comes back in revenue. It's really still one of the biggest returns on investment out there. It's also the best way to reach your what I call core advocates. And these are the people who really, really care about your museum and its mission. These are the volunteers. These are the people who are repeat visitors. These are the folks in the community who come in whenever they have friends from out of town. This is the teacher who's taken a field trip to your museum every school year for 20 years. These are the people who love you as well as the people who came there on a field trip or a bus tour or were brought in by those friends um, who took them there when they were in from out of town and signed up for your mailing list and had a great experience. They should be mailed to on a regular schedule. You shouldn't just be announcing events and exhibits. You should also have a monthly e-newsletter that contains information about what's going on at the museum and keeps people informed and feels like they're part of the museum family. And you should also occasionally send out special e-blasts for great events or programs that you have. People will come to expect a great newsletter. They'll ask you when it's coming out next. They'll ask you if you can include special news in there related to your mission. It will become an event that moves the museum family together if you have a great newsletter. Every time it comes out, it's almost a little event in and of itself. People will come to expect it. And the great thing about email, going back to the question that somebody had about how do we measure what's working, one thing that really works very well is don't put all of your news into the email newsletter. Instead, put short summaries of articles and then have people click through to your blog to read the full article, and then you'll be able to see what gets clicked on the most and see what, article, what topics, what articles are most interesting to people. That brings me to the idea of how you should make web, email, and social media work together. You definitely, you want to be doing social media, you want to be doing email marketing, you want to be you having a great web presence. You also want to make sure all of them are coherent and speak to each other. So for instance, you want to use your blog to highlight that very specific information, whether it's great photos or great information about um, your next acapella performance. 
And you want to include links to them in the email newsletter, as I mentioned. You also want to make sure you're tweeting those things out and you're posting them to Facebook so that everything you do should drive people back to your website. You want to make sure that people keep coming back to your site regardless of where they're finding you so that you can measure that traffic and engage with them on your website. You also want to make sure that you have a very consistent brand image. And by brand image, I mean you want to make sure that you're using the same language everywhere, consistent images. And that can be a problem when you have a lot of volunteers working on a project. So make sure you have a central repository of acceptable images that are good quality. You don't want people posting a cell phone picture that they took themselves that's poorly exposed when you have a professional photo of the same item. Make sure you have a central repository so that if anything gets posted to Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and on your website, it all looks really good and professional. And if you have a lot of volunteers working on a project, make sure you have um, some training to get them all working consistently together. Christina, we so do now have a we'll one, move on. Um, oh, go ahead. Follow up question to that one. Um, any useful suggestions for managing posts of multiple employees handle social media accounts? Um, I'm guessing this is more not one person's handling it like the volunteers, but this would be more like staff and stuff like that if they have accounts that they could post to. I would definitely maintain a calendar um, or a spreadsheet just to make sure that people don't duplicate efforts. It's also a matter of training. So make sure that people, before they post something, tweet it, make sure that they check the Twitter feed or the Facebook page to make sure it hasn't already been posted there. And again, it goes back to the idea of you should have social media training for anyone who handles your social media accounts so they use consistent tone and language. Um, if you have several people, though, who have great personal style and you actually want them to let their personalities shine through, I would have people sign their tweets and sign their Facebook pages. So let's say your visitor services person is just the absolutely most hilarious diva and you love the stuff she posts. Um, and your curator is maybe more thoughtful and scholarly, but you also absolutely love the stuff he posts. Make sure that they then sign it, and then that can also inject some more personality and make people feel more part of the museum family. If you're more concerned about just making sure somebody does everything consistently, um, using Excel spreadsheets or Google Docs to track tweets and posts is, is really helpful. Um, Pre-writing tweets and then programming them using um, one of the tools that's going to be in the resource sheet called Hootsuite. The other one is TweetDeck. You can actually have someone program tweets and Facebook posts um, whenever they have some downtime, and they'll go out consistently on a monthly basis. So make sure that somebody knows who's doing the Twitter and Facebook that day. You might have like an emergency need to post something, like there's been a weather weather-related closure. So make sure that you have a calendar set up that keeps track of who's doing what on what day. So let's move on to areas where you can save. And I'm going to sort of step back and say this with a caveat that this is some of this is my personal personal viewpoint. It is all supported by research. Um, different marketing channels work for different people. However, these are areas where I and research have found that people can, especially museums, be wasting money. Um, one is large, glossy print magazine ads. They're very high prestige. There's certainly an argument to be made for having them. I'm not saying don't do them. But you can't tell if a print ad is working if there's no tracking embedded in it, whether you have a special web address that only gets published in that, um, in that print ad. So you can track the number of people coming to that page, but that's a lot of work for a lot of museums. Or you have a coupon code included in that. If you're taking out a lot of print ads and you're wondering if they're doing you any good, try implementing some form of tracking like that, like a coupon code or a special web address people can go to and see if in fact people are responding at all to that ad. It may be an area where you're spending thousands of dollars a year if you're a large enough museum and it's not actually um, paying too many dividends. The other thing that I would recommend against are big untargeted mailings. I, I mentioned this earlier as well in the webinar. So sending out something to everybody in Massachusetts might work um, if you're a very broad-based museum, such as, say, the MSA. If you're more focused on kids, 
you might want to do a targeted mailing only through to K through 12 teachers or only to families with kids, where you want to maybe mail only to within the zip code. You can purchase mailing lists and access mailing lists for so many different demographics, but there's really no reason to blanket an entire geographic area with a mailer. <coughs> Excuse me. It also often is effective to only mail to your own members. The other area where I see people waste is in rack cards, and they put them in lots of locations. This is the rack card is kind of a, a venue staple. A lot of venues really believe in rack cards, and they do work, um, whether they're in hotel lobbies or whether they're at visitor centers. Um, but they do cost a, a fair amount to print and distribute. And again, I would just recommend that if you're concerned about whether your rack cards are really helping you or not, getting some competitive quotes, first of all, for printing. And again, implementing some kind of tracking so that you really know whether people are responding to it or not. You can save. Again, track your print ads with the coupons. And special web pages. Another thing you can do, though, is do smaller or co-op ads. Maybe you don't need a two-page spread. Maybe you need one quarter-page ad. Maybe it'll be just as effective. You can also go co-op. That is often a wonderful way to club together with several museums and promote all of your offerings at once so that your geographic location is a destination or your topic. For instance, if you are a group of children's museums within a certain area. You could put all of your ads together into one beautifully designed ad. Again, targeting by household type or job interest, we've already covered some of this. You can also target by income level, if that's the criteria that matters to you. It does cost more for these lists, but it is very much worth it. Um, you, can also, you can also really save a lot of money by doing only a small subset of the list and seeing if you get any response at all, again, with tracking, and only then mail to the whole list. That can often help as well. And again, bear in mind, you're tailoring your message to the demographics. Um, Christina, we do have a couple questions. Allie, I'm going to come back to yours in a second. Um, but this one is, how do you get the targeted mailing list? There are a group, there are several vendors out there. Um, if you Google for mailing lists and the criteria that you are looking for, whether it's your zip code or it's fan, or it's families with kids under 10, you can do that. Um, there, there are reputable list brokers and there are not so reputable list brokers. My number one place where I would recommend going for a list is magazine mailing lists. There's a magazine for absolutely every interest. So if you want to reach, um, you know, moms of kids under 12, you could find magazines for parents and you could access the mailing list that way. Those lists are pretty clean because magazines, after all, don't send out issues to people who aren't current subscribers. So you know these people are there, that they really exist, and they're interested in that topic because they're subscribing to that magazine. Also, these list brokers tend to be, um, they're a little bit more pricey, but they never do anything unethical. So they wouldn't, Give, they don't sell people's names unless those people checked off when they signed up for the mailing list that yes, it's okay to hear from your sponsors. So you're, you're getting something that's ethical. Because if you just go out and buy a mailing list from a place that you haven't checked out, um, you could be getting people who, people's names that have been stolen from somewhere. But magazines tend not to do that. So it's a consent-based list. And it's not that expensive. It depends on the, it depends on the interest group. Okay, and then we have another social media question. Um, are there tr um, training sessions for social media that you would suggest attending, or are there certain groups that offer the training? There are a lot of ways you can learn social media. A lot of colleges are now offering certificates in social media. Um, I, I actually have one. There's also, um, here in the Boston area, I, I don't know um, where you're located, but um, Google has a very extensive nonprofit program. And although the training tends not to be in social media per se, but in how do you measure metrics or do Google AdWords, they also often offer um, open house hours where you can meet with a digital marketing expert as part of their giving back to the community. Um, also in the research, resource sheet, um, there are several magazines 
that cater to social media marketers and they have webinars. And so that would be an area where you can sign up for those webinars as well as, you know, we have a museum a marketing ebook. And if there's enough interest, we'll maybe put together another one of those. But there's a lot of free stuff out there. I would definitely recommend um, Social Media Today. It's also it's, it's in that sheet. They have webinars frequently, and they are free. Ragan is another one, R-A-G-A-N. Um, they're more to train people in PR, but Social Media and PR overlap a lot in today's marketing practices, and they have free webinars as well. HubSpot is pretty good. I have actually a couple lists um, myself on that one. If anybody wants to contact me here at NEMA, um, I do have some that I get emailed occasionally. And then continuing on to more questions, <laughs> um, what metric is the most important to consider when evaluating whether or not to go with a particular online ad venue? That is a really good question. I would say ask about the engagement with those ads and how targeted their audience is. So again, we, you want to find the audience that aligns with the people you're trying to reach and ask them, okay, who reads location? Um, if it's a niche publication for um, fly fishermen and you're a fly fishing museum, you can be pretty sure that the, the people reading that magazine are fly fisher folks. So that's less a relevant of question there. But in a general mailing list, you want to know um, who these people are, what their demographics are, what their location is, etc. I'd also ask what the average click-through and open rates are in any email newsletters that they send out. Because some people um, have been over-marketed too. If a magazine um, sends out an ad-laden newsletter every other day, that list may be absolutely tired of seeing those newsletters, and their open rates might be abysmal. You know, you could pay fifteen hundred dollars for an ad, and they say that you're reaching, you know, four million readers, but in fact, only one percent of them ever open the newsletter anymore. So, you know, ask them, ask them what the open rates are. If they're unwilling to share that information, that might be a big red flag. If it's a really good open rate, then they're usually very selective in how much they send out and what kind of ads they run and the ads are very relevant to their audience. So that's going to be a really good sign. Sometimes those can be a little bit pricier, but you obviously want people seeing your ad and engaging with it. So those are some really, um, really key metrics. Okay, and then um, can everybody hear us? Because it sounds like we might have some audio issues. Just want to check in with all if you guys can hear us. Um, yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing several yeses in terms of whether or not people can hear us, but then a few that can't. It sounds like everybody. It looks like it's spotty here and there, so <laughs> there's okay. a lot of people answering. So let me scroll back up to the question as everybody's doing this. Um, have you ever used Eventbrite to increase guests at events and programs, and does this work? And do the guests stay involved? Yes. Um, so Eventbrite, if you're doing an event that's time limited, so you're doing an opening reception, Eventbrite definitely is is a way to go. Um, and what it does is it has a vast network of people who are members because they've bought a ticket from Eventbrite at one point. So it's going to push your event out to those people. So if you're doing a one-time open to the public event, um, yeah, I have used it, and it and it does work. And, and in fact, um, what what Eclipse is is it's just sort of an bright for things that are more elaborate than that. In other words, if you're bringing a whole busload of people to a place, and it's taking days to plan. So I'm a big believer in it, and um, I would definitely go ahead and use it, especially since you can embed it into your website. Um, and that brings me over to the idea of of advertising and how you can afford it. So in addition to taking out smaller ads or, or co-op ads, you might also want to switch from print ads to online advertising. Um, ads, whether they're print or online, tend to be just so that it's seen you. People don't normally jump up if they see an ad, unless it's a circular for a product they're shopping for, like dishwashers. 
and immediately take action. It's more of an awareness thing. Um, the click-through on online display ads, so ads that are just a picture on the side of the New York Times or another online publication, is 0.37%. People don't take immediate action on an ad, whether they see it in print or online, but they will have heard of you. So if you just want to get your name out there, um, display ads that are online versus print are going to be a fraction of the cost, and people will have awareness of you. There's also something called the Google Display Network. So if you do Google AdWords, um, the paid version, not the grant-funded version, you can put a beautiful display ad. They even have templates where you just upload some photos. Um, of your museum or your collections, and they'll create an ad for you, including ones that have a slideshow that will embed on websites. And I've done them, and they're quite beautiful. Um, and you can pay only when people click on the ad. So you could have an ad running for quite some time. Thousands of people would see it, and you'd only be paying a few dollars because you would only be paying for that tiny 1% or, or one third of a percent who click on the ad itself. There are all services such as Outbrain and a couple of others that will put an ad um, at the bottom of different publications. If you read the Huffington Post or the New York Times or um, any publication like that, you'll often see a little box that has a headline in it and a little bit of information. And it looks a little like an article, but different. And it says that it's a sponsored link. And it takes you to somebody else's website. So you can pay for that. So if you have a really interesting article or an ebook or um, some materials that you've created that is really content and that's informative and interesting to a particular publication's readership, you can pay to have one of those links put up. Um, and again, advertising in email newsletters is often cheaper than advertising in print publications as well. And you can measure the return on investment. So even if you think that you can't afford advertising and your only choice is to wear a sandwich board like our little friend here on the screen, um, you probably have a couple of other options. And they can deliver about as much return on the investment as, as advertising generally does, which is people will have heard of you. So to sum up, you really can market your museum on a shoestring. It's really key to bring it all together, set priorities, and look for combined campaigns. For instance, um, combine PR on your new exhibit, such as writing about a key piece in that exhibition with a ad in a targeted email blast and a targeted postcard mailing to only people within a certain geographic area who also fit certain demographic um, requirements that you have, and multiple social media posts on Twitter and Facebook. Do what's called an integrated campaign. Bring all of those great content assets and collateral pieces you have, gorgeous photos of the paintings or the pottery or the objects in that exhibit, great content written by your curator or your marketing person or what have you, and make, make it relevant on different channels. Design a nice banner ad to be put in the newsletter for people who quilt or for people who um, love pottery. Get included. Um, as an article in a quilting or a pottery publication. Mail out postcards to people who subscribe to a magazine that's relevant to quilting. And post to Facebook with some gorgeous photos of the quilt in the new exhibit or the pottery in the new exhibit, and you'd be surprised at how many people share it. Reuse those materials. Get them out there as much as possible in different places. All of these things we've talked about can all be brought together in a really cost-effective way because everything that you have, all the professional photography and all the writing can be reused across multiple channels. So not only are the channels affordable, but they can all use the same concerted pool of content assets, and you're going to save even more money that way. And then measure. Um, we already covered this because we had a question. But here is a quick slide talking about all of the different ways that you can measure things. I mentioned Google Analytics. It's in the resource sheet under Google Learn. Um, track coupon redemption, use Hootsuite and Facebook's own built-in insights called Facebook Insights that come with your Facebook page. Measure how people respond, and you'll be very pleasantly surprised. Um, we are closing in on 1 o'clock, so I'd like to open it up for a few more questions. I want to say thank you so much for attending this um, webinar. Again, my name is Christine Inge. I'm the VP of Marketing for Etrips, which is a platform bringing museums and other venues together with teachers. 
going on educational trips. Um, the blog is at edtrips.com. There's going to be tips there if you want to read the blog um, with more of this content. If you have any questions that didn't get covered, you can email me or tweet at me at edtrips or at Christina Inge, and we'll try to get an answer to your question that way. But there's time for a couple questions. So um, there's my contact info if you're shy or we run out of time. And otherwise, um, I'll, I'll answer a couple questions right now. Okay, we do have a few coming in, so if you guys do have questions, keep writing. Um, any advice for convincing board members that more attention should be spent on newer media than old? It's a good one. Uh, use, use evidence. Um, Mashable is a great, great place to get um, information about how people are using media. Uh, basically, just show them how much of a return on investment for relatively little dollars you're going to get from new media. Um, there's also a couple of sites. I'll post it to the Etrips blog um, because it's not in the resource thing. There's a couple of sites that provide marketing charts that look at industry aggregate data on how many people click on the average newsletter, um, how many dollar investment in digital advertising will deliver what results. So you can just put together a PowerPoint of that or just print those things off. They're free. They come in really nice PDFs. And again, I'll post to the um, blog that you see right there on the screen at trips.com. Print them off. They're free. And show it to them. Um, I'd say also that the money argument is right there. I mean, it costs a fraction to put up a digital ad versus a print ad. So you can just say, I found a great way to cut our, our operating expenses as well. But um, there's some really good things um, from eMarketer that, that I'll share as well. Okay, and then should YouTube be part of our marketing efforts? It takes a lot of commitment. It depends. Um, it, if, if you can create good video, then do it. Um, it. If you can't consistently create at least five to ten videos per year, um, your, your YouTube page is going to look very paltry. Um, it depends on really what your museum is about and whether you can create videos. If you cater primarily to children, it's kind of hard to do videos because you have to get a lot of permissions. Um, one thing I would recommend, though, is is make invest in a professional videographer or someone with a good camera and make them good. It's better to not do YouTube at all if you can't create good videos. On the other hand, if you can create great, funny, viral videos and have a storyline that people tune into every week or every month, you could absolutely become an overnight internet sensation. It all depends on whether you want to invest the time. And then just off to mention again, um, the PowerPoint presentation and the resource sheet is available on the NEMA website right now. And then the recording will be available um, a little bit later, probably in the next day or two, because um, I need mm -hmm. to transfer that over. Is there any other last questions? No, it looks like we're good. And Christina, I want to thank you so much for giving this. This is actually our largest um, lunch with NEMA to date. Which is kind of cool. <laughs> wow! Yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> so. Yes. Thanks, Christina, and thank you, Heather, for setting up everything. Great, and great job. Great job. Thank you. And I um for coming. I, to thank you. I was going to say that the the question the person had about evidence they want for the board. Um, I'll pull a few things together that you can use, and I will tweet it out um, so that you can just access it, and you'll see it on Twitter. I'll do it this afternoon. Um, we do have a question of how many attended. We had um, a max at one point of 91 people. So wow. That, yeah, yeah, so that was pretty good. That was pretty cool. And then also, you guys all might be interested in our next uh, lunch with NEMA, which will be on Wednesday, February 26th. It's small site, big reward, successfully managing functions with a staff of one. I think this is right up the alley for a lot of you guys that attended today. And if you do have any suggestions on what you would like to see on future Lunch with NEMA, please contact the NEMA staff. We're always looking for ideas of you know, different workshops or different lunches with NEMA. And this is a great way to be able to reach our membership is through this type of um, webinar um, system. There any, I think there's a lot of thank yous coming in, Christina. Looks like everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. And um, again, uh, Heather, as she mentioned, there, the resource sheet is going to be available right away. So um, everything that was mentioned, including the points, is going to be up there. Okay. So 
Lots of thanks. And so I guess it's one all two. So we will be saying goodbye for this month, but please join us again on the fourth Wednesday of February. And thanks again. All right. Thank Bye. you.